Before the advent of Sunday shopping, most folk of my generation learned how to drive right here in a supermarket parking lot. Little room to get into trouble, and the main lesson that Dad was teaching us out here was how to drive a standard gearbox, and for me, it was the three-on-a-tree version. Now, most young people, and rightly so, are learning to drive at a professional driving school, right? Well, yes and no, because the young man we are about to meet is only 12 years old. And you know where he's learning his driving skills? Are you ready for this? At a racetrack. It wasn't something that we had, we had planned for him to be racing a, a full-size car when he was 12, but he was... You know, he, he was very successful in the quarter midgets. He, he, um, he won a multiple championships and big races and stuff. And he was getting to the point with, with the quarter midgets where, um, I, you know, I, he just needed to be challenged a little more again. So uh, th this was good. He's certainly challenged here. Uh, my dad's taught me about everything I know about racing, you know, he's taught me set up, how to work on the car and everything, you know. I'm one of those drivers that's just like, get in and go, you know, you're going to the front, you can't go anywhere else. We've uh, been racing for a long time. Uh, dad raced up at Speedway Park in Hamilton in the 60s and uh, my brothers and I got into it. My kids have gotten into it. Uh, Caden's my oldest and he's, uh, he started in 2005 in quarter midgets and he's, he's moved in street stocks and uh, my other two boys are still racing quarter midgets. You know, if it weren't for Dad, none of us would be racing. You know, it was actually his idea to get into this stuff, and, and I told him he was crazy. You know, we're not going to stick a 12-year-old in a, in a full-blown race car. And, and uh, he convinced me that it, it was logical somehow. It's not really me that's, that should be blamed. My father should be blamed. He started as very young. But basically, all he had to do was grow a little bit so he could touch the pedals. Uh, it, it, this Driving this car isn't a whole lot different than driving the quarter midgets. We were concerned about uh, him not being competitive, maybe a little bit intimidated. Uh, and that's not the case at all. I think there is some people who aren't really thrilled about him out there, but you know, the truth of the matter is he's 12, but he's been racing for seven years, and for five years he's raced three cars, so you could say he's got 21 years of experience plus, which is probably a lot more than a lot of people. Are. That kid can drive. It is amazing how much he has learned from opening night until now. The guys that have way more experience, they've been, you know, they're going to pressure him a lot more. As long as he's patient, he takes his time, he, he comes from a racing background, and uh, he's won a lot in quarter midgets and stuff, and he's going to be, uh, he'll be one of the, the next great ones for sure. I'm not totally relaxed. Like with the quarter midget, yes, I was, but with this, um, I'm a bundle of nerves from the time he goes out there and that. But um, I just want, I just want him to do well. I mean, a win is nice, but um, I just like him to do well out there and, and to learn something. Mom sort of gets really nervous when I'm out there. You know, she's always jumping up and down at the fence, yelling at me, even though I can't hear. So I don't see a point in that. She has a good reaction to racing. She's been around it all her life, and so it's uh, pretty good. Winning would be great, you know. I've I've had so many good runs and it's just it's just luck. You need a lot of it. We love doing it as a family and all the boys enjoy it. And even my daughter enjoys it. She's already itching to get in a quarter midget, so I'm kind of pushing her towards dance, but we'll see. He's made his mistakes and he's uh taking his lumps and uh you know I think he's he's gaining some respect around here and it, you know it's a balancing thing and um uh, you take the good with the bad, and uh, I see a lot more good than bad in him. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of what he's done. Coming soon, I'm going to try to tame a monster. Not for me or my car. More later on Kenzie's Corner. For the past 15 years, the baby Porsche has been wowing its drivers. On this edition of Test Drive, we go topless in the latest Porsche Boxster S. May the fun begin.
Truth be told, I never was much of a fan of the Porsche Boxster. It just seemed to lack any real sense of substance. Sure, it handled like the Dickens, but that was where its allure ended for me. So heading into the test drive of the 2013 edition, I was wondering what the major rework would do to change my mind. Well, the test drive sure drove things home. One of the areas this Porsche Boxster really does succeed is the amount of cargo space you get considering it's a small two-seater. Up front here, 5.3 cubic feet of cargo space in a deep well. When you get down to the back end, you've got a second cargo hold. It is shallower, but it's much wider and it adds another 4.6 cubic feet. Now the reason it all works so well is right here. The convertible top folds down over the engine and so it doesn't eat into any of the usable cargo space. That means this car enjoys a considerable storage advantage over any of its peers. When it comes to handling, the Boxster dances so well it can only be described as world class, especially when it's equipped with Porsche's optional active suspension. In normal mode, when the driver pushes the limits, it automatically adopts the sport mode to counter the minuscule amount of body roll that does surface. Likewise, in sport, it can soften the suspenders when it senses a lazy drive. Either way, the ride is taut but not harsh, as only the most abrupt bumps actually filter back to the occupants. The fact the body is incredibly stiff, which banishes all and any hint of cowl shape, gives it the right base of operations. The cabin of this Boxster S is very nice indeed, and it's certainly driver focused. To begin with, these seats are simply superb. They really do hug and keep you planted when you play. But the one thing I did notice is how many options you have to add to get a car like this. To begin with, Bose audio system, a number of mechanical upgrades, a navigation system, the list goes on and on right the way through to these. Yes, you'll pay $390 to have yellow seat belts. In the end, this car has got almost $20,000 worth of options on it. Ouch! Factor in the enormous tyres and an electromechanical steering system that's perfectly weighted and the Boxster S devours corners. One feature worth opting for is the Sport Chrono package. Among other things, it adds Sport and Sport Plus modes. The Sport mode sharpens the throttle and ups the red line. The Sport Plus mode does this as well as setting the adaptive suspension to Sport, firming the steering and moving the intervention point of the stability control point out to the point where the back end actually is allowed to slide moderately. Suffice it to say, it all works wonderfully well. One of the neat features on this car is a G-Force meter. Now the numbers it's been churning out are astounding. When we were doing the acceleration tests, this car was pulling 0.88G. Now that's with a manual transmission. I suspect if you had the PDK and used launch control, you'd get a better number. Now as good as that acceleration number is, it was the cornering forces this car generates that truly amazed me. When we were pushing it to the limit, we were getting 1.3 G. Now that is what you call truly tenacious cornering ability. And of course, one of the big reasons this car is so much fun to drive. Finally, well, there's the engine and the G-forces it generates and the intoxicating sound it makes. The 3.4 liter flat six boxer engine puts out 315 horsepower and 266 pound feet of torque. When fired through the six-speed manual box, which is a delight to row, the Boxster S puts 100k on the clock in a very rapid 5.1 seconds. It also manages the more important 80 to 120 passing move in 4.3 seconds in third gear, which is again a very good number. You know, truth be told, I haven't always been a huge Boxster fan. It never did have what it took to just give you that smile quotient. This car, on the other hand, my goodness, it's as much fun as you can have while you're wearing clothes. It is fast, it is truly amazing through a corner, and the fun, well, it just keeps a coming. On that subject, a blue sky, tops down, I'm off to have more fun.
recently had the Mustang Shelby GT500 in the motoring garage, the most powerful production V8 in the world, 662 horses and 631 torque output. Without a doubt, Ford and the late Carroll Shelby have produced the baddest Mustang ever. The heart of this rocket is a 5.8 aluminum block V8. Ford says it will reach 96 kilometers from a standstill in 3.7 seconds. But you know, this monster belongs at a racetrack. And so while we were hanging out with Caden Lapsovich at Sunset Speedway, we asked his dad, Jeff, if he'd take it for a few laps and see if indeed this vehicle belongs on the banked oval. Yeah, that, that's a really fun car to drive. It's got uh, plenty of power, plenty of brakes, very responsive the way it steers. It, it was a little different for me because it's got so much, it's got those great big monster Brembo brakes on the front. You, you, you know, you just touch them a little bit and the thing really slows down. It uh, felt like I was having to slow down and then get back on the gas and go again. It was a lot of fun to drive. If you get back in it again, where would you drive with this car? I'd probably get her a little closer to the wall, I think, and maybe drop her down a gear and see if we can turn some more RPM, because I, I don't think I was using it until it's full potential, but uh, uh, it'd be nice to take out around Mosport, I can tell you that for sure. Anybody at Ford's watching, uh, any, any advice you'd like to give him or suggestion? I'm not really big on the color. <laughs> I like black, but I guess that's everyone's preference. But uh, um, other, other than that, uh, I think it's a beautiful car. Well done. Well, it looks like a cloudy future for show and shines. I'm Ted Laternus, and I'll tell you why on MotoreTV.com. For 2013, Subaru introduces the XV Crosstrack. This is based largely on the Impreza, but it's aimed at another demographic. They're trying to bring in the Gen Ys, you know, those 30-something guys, the ones who are still out running marathons, etc. Here you got the bikes, here you got the ATV. It'll tow 680 kilograms, it's raised up off the ground, more clearance than a Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's all about the active, adventurous lifestyle. So, what is Subaru's goal here? Surprise! They want to increase market share to around 3% of the Canadian market, they say. And the Crosstrek might just do it for them. This CUV adds an entry-level Forester-like vehicle to the lineup while also spicing up an otherwise boring Impreza. thing to consider with the Crosstrek is that it is powered by the 2.0-liter Boxer engine, which is just fine. However, it is only 148 horsepower has two transmissions, CVT, automatic, and the five-speed manual. If you're looking for a little bit of jam, you want to go with the five-speed manual because at least that way you get to hold your RPMs. Crosstrek image is all about looks. It's tall, rugged, has eye-catching colors. Inside, though, it's dull by comparison. And while the interior is functional and neat, it just doesn't match the excitement generated by the exterior. Subaru compares the clearance of the Crosstrek to that of a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and frankly, that's the only place you should ever use those two names in the same sentence. Then again, Crosstrek is much less expensive, and its off-road ability should be taken more of as a suggestion than a fact. So while the Crosstrek is based on the Impreza, it is not meant to be just an Impreza trim level. In actual fact, this is more of a little brother SUV to the larger Forester one of Subaru's most popular models. However, it is smaller, it is more fuel efficient, it is sportier, and it's meant to bring a whole new class of customer to this segment. Subaru Crosstrek, wilder than an Impreza, milder than a Forester, with a price somewhere in between. Will it bring new customers to the brand? If looks count for anything, then yes, I think it will. I mean, there'll be some customers that won't want to leave the body on frame. We have a great exterior for them for that, and we're going to work hard to keep them in the family. Uh, but at the same time, we haven't walked away from what Pathfinder is. With 5,000 pounds of towing, with a four-wheel drive system that you can still lock into four-wheel drive, which is uh, unique in the segment, uh, we think we'll still deliver that rugged uh, vehicle that the customers want and need. 
The Motoring Tip of the Week is brought to you by Walmart. For everyday low prices on Pennzoil, conventional, and synthetic oils. Our Motoring Tip of the Week concerns freeze protection. When you think of freeze protection, of course, the very first thing you think of is the cooling system of your engine, the antifreeze in the cooling system. And of course, we've got to have a good, strong mixture of antifreeze and coolant. Now the coolant in your radiator, a 50-50 mixture will give you freeze protection to minus 37 degrees Celsius. But some areas of the country, that's not enough freeze protection. In many cases, automotive manufacturers recommend 70% glycol, 30% water mixture in your cooling system. Make sure you've got adequate protection. If you're in any doubt, bring the car into the Walmart Tire Lube Express. The technicians can check the freeze protection and let you know if you've got adequate protection. Remember that even with adequate freeze protection, coolant needs to be changed periodically, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Now in terms of washer fluid, I've never been a fan of using water or summer only fluid in a washer fluid system. The onset of winter comes so fast, you forget about it and it freezes up and it's inoperative when you need it the most. I use a winter fluid year round and I think that's the best bet because modern cars hold so much fluid and it can be a real pain in the neck to drain it. And lastly, batteries. Now we don't directly check a battery for freeze protection, but a fully charged battery that measures 12.6 volts or higher is fully charged and will not freeze. If you've got small equipment, boats, any kind of machinery with a battery that could be laid over for the winter, make sure that A, it's fully charged, 12.6 volts or higher on a digital voltmeter, and that you take off the negative battery cable. And if you can't do that, you might want to think about removing the battery from the vehicle and bringing it into an area of a building that won't be below freezing. That's your motoring tip of the week. Monsters can be scary. Take Godzilla, for instance. Now this one isn't scary because it's not real, but that one is. That's a 2013 Nissan GTR nicknamed Godzilla, and this is the two minute test run. The real Godzilla has a big tail and some sharp teeth. The GTR has a big tail and some sharp teeth with a 545 horsepower twin turbo V6. It's actually a front mid-engine design because the engine sits behind the center line of the front wheel. All that power is delivered by a Nissan Atessa all-wheel drive system. When you're driving the GTR, everything is being recorded by the computer, including steering, brake, G-force, and throttle sensors. You can then download all that information and review it. That way you can see why you're slow. You also have to stop this 1,700 kilogram monster. So to do that, Nissan called Brembo and ordered 15-inch floating rotors and six-piston calipers up front and four-piston calipers out back. I can tell on the GTR from going through this pylon course, it handles like it's on rails. What I'd really like to do is take it on a track, but unfortunately, in this particular GTR, Nissan says no. My pet peeve with this car is a couple of things, and they both center around the door. First, the door handles, while they may be artsy, they're difficult to open with one hand. Also, the window switches are difficult to operate because they have a bar placed right in front of them. At the end of the day, the GTR really is a monster. It's insane fast, and if you like street monsters, you'll love it. It's a real supercar. However, if you have to drive it every day, like most monsters, it can be a bit scary. I'm Russ Bond, and this has been the Two Minute Test Drive. Closed captioning for Motoring 2013 is brought to you by Greener, Fuel Efficient, Global. This is Chevrolet Now, driving our world forward. A bunch of years ago, ethanol was supposed to be the next big thing. Now, I told you a bunch of years ago that putting food into your gas tank was probably not a great idea. You'd be able to afford to either drive to the McDonald's or buy the Big Mac, but not both. But car companies were figuring, hey, the U.S. government's giving us subsidies to build ethanol-capable cars, and they were giving rebates to customers who buy them, so why not? 
Well, what happened was people would be faced with the choice of perhaps a four-cylinder car that was not ethanol capable or a V6 that was, and they'd get a $1,000 rebate. Who's not going to buy that deal? But of course, they couldn't find ethanol to put in the car, even the so-called E85, 85% ethanol, 15% gasoline. So they just put regular fuel in the car. So here they got a subsidy of $1,000 to buy a car which theoretically was more fuel efficient, but in fact wasn't. If they'd bought the four-cylinder, they'd be saving fuel for the entire length of the car's life. Well, the U.S. government, oddly enough, finally came to their senses and they cut the ethanol subsidy. So now we can go back to growing food for people to eat as opposed to put in the gas tank. Now, I should hate to say, I told you so, but I told you so, I'm Jim Kent. It was a good evening for Caden Lapsevich, but the night is not over because now the entire family will hit the road for Montreal where dad is racing in a NASCAR event. And then under 48 hours later, they'll all be back at Sunset Speedway for another race. You know that old adage, win on Sunday and sell on Monday? Well, I think in this case, we can add one to the list and that would be the family that races together stays together. Before we go, make sure you check us out at MotoringTV.com and join us on Facebook. Get in on the conversation for the total motoring experience. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Well, this is completely redesigned. Um, the car is a little wider. I mean, the interior is all new. Three great new powertrains. I mean, there's nothing carryover in this product at all. It is the brand new Chevrolet Malibu.